Mark chapter 14, verse 1, you there? Okay. It was now two days before the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And the chief priest and the scribes were seeking how to arrest him, being Jesus, by stealth and kill him. For they said, not during the feast, lest there be an uproar from the people. And while he was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, as he was reclining at the table, a woman entered or a woman came with an alabaster flask of ointment to pour nard very costly, and she broke the flask and poured it over his head. For there uh, were some who said to themselves indignantly, why was the ointment wasted like that? For this ointment could have been sold for more than 300 denarii and given to the poor. And they scalded her. But Jesus said, leave her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has done a beautiful thing to me, for you will always have the poor with you. And whenever you want, you can do good for them, but you will not always have me. She has done what she could. She has anointed my body beforehand for burial. And truly, I say to you, wherever the gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in memory of her. One more time, let's pray over the reading of the word of the Lord this morning. Father, we just come to you again, asking you to open up our eyes, open up our hearts and our minds, that we may see the truth of your word, that there is just one truth, and it is found only through Jesus Christ, our Savior. And I pray, God, that when we leave this space today, that we would be able to leave and all collectively say, how glorious and majestic is our King Jesus. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Now, I'm going to track along with three uh, different statements that are taking place in this particular chapter. The first one I want to take notice of is the woman entering, and I want to consider her action in what she did. So when the text says, as he's reclining, a woman came. And then I want us to look at the second thing here is how perhaps some of us would respond, and how the disciples respond is that they scolded her, and then I want to look at what Jesus has to say, his commendation to her, and we'll see that the lady was devoted, the lady was scolded, and then later Jesus would commend her for her acts. So let's take a look at this first thing right here. Everybody okay by with me right now? All right, just make a share. So first of all, let's look at this phrase right here. As Jesus is reclining, it's, it's the week of like Passover. A woman enters. A woman kind of enters in while he's at Bethany, the house of Simon the leper. He was there having a meal. Now, the interesting thing about this, if we kind of remember it's been some time ago since we were in chapter 12. How did chapter 12 end. If you recall, chapter 12 ended with another story of a woman. This woman gave the, the penny, right? She gave everything she had. And everybody was like, and Jesus like commends her for this. Like Jesus is saying like, she understands what sacrifice looks like. That's how Tucked in between the Olivet Discourse, which is what we just got out of in chapter 13, which is that, uh, that, that kind of saying of Jesus is saying, this is what's going to happen in the near future, and perhaps this is what will look like in the far future. And tucked in between this eschatological view is this story of a woman sacrificing and another story of a woman sacrificing. This is what we've been calling, if you remember, and this may make you hungry because I'm hungry right now, a Markin sandwich, right? It's the Markin sandwich is what you got the bread, then you got this meat, then you got another bread. We see this again, this theme of this Markin sandwich. We have a woman giving everything she had, not even thinking about, you know what, I could use this penny for bread. You know what, I could use this penny to give to somebody else. But she gives it to God because she understands what sacrifice is. 
Then we get this view of end times. And then right after this, we have yet another view of a woman, another woman showing to us what true sacrifice looks like. If, if I were to be politically incorrect, and I am a politically incorrect person, just don't hang around me if that offends you. If we were to be politically incorrect, we would call her an extremist. This is what, now hang with me because I'll get to that in just a minute. This is what extremism looks like. If that's too politically incorrect for you, then I'll, I'll, I'll Christianize it for you and say this is what radicalism looks like. Now, some of you may be a little more comfortable with that word. This is what Christian sacrifice looks like. And for some reason, tucked in between this, stay awake, Jesus is coming. For some reason, it's sandwiched, sandwiched around the idea of sacrifice and what this looks like. I wonder if Jesus, or the writer here, is trying to tell us something about that. So we're introduced to this lady, and she has, she's brought in the alabaster jar. You've probably heard 100 sermons on this, and so I'm not going to belabor the point about the alabaster jar. You can go do your own research for yourself, but we know what we need to know. The biggest point about this is that it's very costly. It's worth a year's wages. This isn't like some essential oil you'd be carrying around in your purse, or you ain't going to be carrying around a full jar of this stuff in a bag. This is a very intentional motive. And not only that, but it's also in a very expensive thing that's taking place. An entire, entire year's worth of money, salary. And I, I did the research for you. You don't have to go Google right now that the average salary in Utah, the state of Utah, is $48,000. So if you make $48,000... You, you just spent $48,000 on perfume. Now, I don't know if there's any perfume out there that, is, that would cost you $48,000. And I don't know if anyone is dumb enough to pay $48,000. If you've paid $48,000 for perfume, we need to talk. In fact, just bypass me. Go straight to the psychiatrist because you need help. Nobody in their right mind, ought to be paying $48,000 for some perfume. But this is what this lady has done. This, annual, this year's worth salary now likely has been passed down. It's been maybe for in this family heirloom. We don't know. We just know. And the only thing we need to know is that it was expensive. And it cost a lot of money. And we know that this is the reason why this is causing such kind of strife in the, among the disciples. Now, why would you have a jar of perfume? Well, there were two reasons why you'd have a jar of perfume. One would be you would use it for maybe a marriage. The other would be that you would anoint the individual's body in preparation for the burial. And so here comes a lady, maybe it's a woman's intuition and that thing's real. Amen, lady. Y'all should have said amen right there. That's, there's no lie that there's, like, I don't know, maybe it's a, it's a gift that wasn't mentioned in the Bible, but it's a gift y'all have. It's called, the, amen, it's called the woman's intuition. And this woman got it. The disciples didn't get it. Right? You remember Jesus is using the, the first woman with, with the whole penny debacle, and, and he says, look, it's not about how much you give. It's about, it's about your, your sacrifice that you give. And, and, and you would think that disciples go, hmm, I've never really heard of it that way. You know, I've never thought that Jesus is wanting me to sacrifice all that I have. But you know what they do? Like the, the next verse, they go outside and they see the temple and they're like, dang, this is a really cool temple. I mean, it's like just, it, it's, it's the story of the disciples. They just don't get it. And yet here it is again. Jesus is yet again 
drawing us to this illustration, this story that actually took place, this woman that where she's going to make these disciples look like they really are and which is really foolish because they don't get what sacrifice really looks like. You know, so they're grumbling and complaining about what she's doing. But what this woman is doing is preparing the body of Christ to be buried. What she's doing is remarkable. Now, if, if you would like, I, I have, I have a, uh, the Bible actually has a lot to say about oil and, and, and pouring it over on the head. And I'm, I'm, you know, I'm reading through this and, and you may actually have uh, Bible references on, on your scriptures. And maybe one of them is Psalm 23. When, and I know this isn't healthy to say, what is Jesus thinking in this? Because you don't know them. You, we don't know what Jesus is thinking. But I wonder if Jesus is sitting there in this event. And I wonder if he's sitting there thinking about the Psalms, thinking about how, how you have prepared a table before me in the presence of my enemies. How, how you have anointed my head with oil. How surely the goodness and mercy of the Lord will follow me all to the ends of my days. I wonder if Jesus perhaps is thinking through this verse because remember what happened in the very first two verses. Who's out to get him? The religious people. And then if you, if you just kind of read down just a little bit, who, who's out to get him? Judas. So, so yet again, another Mark and Sandwich happening here. You have in the beginning of chapter 14 and at the end of chapter 14, people who are trying to trap Jesus and kill him. And here is a woman in the middle of it anointing Jesus. And, and perhaps Jesus is thinking about this psalm that says, surely you have prepared a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Because his enemies were all around him. They're waiting to get him. They're waiting to arrest him. And yet this incredible act is taking place right here. And so we have this idea. So here's this lady. She enters into the story of the gospel of Mark. She pours out this oil. And she's in, in, in a way that this is an action of her just giving out her whole future to Christ. Giving out all that she is. Everything that she is saved up for as this ultimate sacrifice to say, things don't own me. I, I don't want anything of this world. No materialistic thing is going to define who I am. But instead, I'm going to pour it out on the head of Christ. And, and, and kind of in a sense of what she's saying is that I give all my future, I give everything that I have, and I, and I pour it out on the head of Christ. And then you'll notice the response of these I was going to say well-meaning disciples, but I don't think this is well-meaning at all. I think these are just these guys are just being jerks at this point, and and they're going to be, you know, they're going to, they're going to kind of uh, fabricate it with, well, what about the poor? You know, they, that's how they're going to do it. So so they scold her, and and then look at verse number four. There were some who said to themselves indignantly. Now John tells us in his uh, his whole rendition of this story that it was Judas who led this charge. Um, but we also can apply this to Mark, and you realize it's not just Judas, but he was the mouthpiece, but he's clearly not alone in his disgruntledness of what this woman is doing. And so Mark tells us that they grumbled. The, the Greek word for, for grumbled is, is more clearly defined for us as snorting. You ever been so mad that you snort? If you've been married, you probably have. If you've raised children, you probably have. I mean, they just get you so fired up that you just, I mean, it's almost like a growl comes out of you. Like, like, whoa, brother, do we need to get the anointing oil for you? Because something seems to be coming out of you, right? Like that kind of anger that just, just makes you, just gets you. So this is what they're doing. That an act of worship, an act of self-sacrifice causes these guys to be so angry that they snort and that they growl at her. Man, would it have been so cool to be in this room at this point in the story. And I don't know if it had been cool for me because I don't know if I, if I would have uh, mocked them or if I would have joined them. And you don't know the answer to that either. 
But what we do know is that these guys are absolutely furious because this wasn't a part of the agenda tonight, right? Like this wasn't a part of how tonight was supposed to go. Wouldn't be no supposed, so it was supposed to be some woman walking up in here destroying our meal. So, so she's, she, she, they're, 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 snor- they're angry. Why is that that they're angry? And I, maybe I could answer this for Judas, and maybe this is conjecture. I don't know. Maybe this is just me, but in my view, this is why they're angry. At least this is in part why Judas is angry, because Jesus perhaps was following after a Jesus who would give him something. Let me just, just think about that for a second. Think about the crowds that follow Jesus. If you, if you go through the gospel of, of John, you, and in our study through the gospel of Mark, think about the the crowds of people who left Jesus. Particularly, and I'm thinking of when Jesus said, if, if you want to be a follower of me, you've got to eat my flesh and drink my blood. And immediately, thousands of people walked away from him. Why, why, why are people always walking away from Jesus? It's because they're always after what he can provide for them. Give me miracles, give me signs, give me wealth, give me health, give me pleasures, and you give me what I think I deserve. And so on the opposite end of this is we have what the example ought to be. A woman who is following after Jesus, not for what he can give her, but what can I give Jesus? And the thing that I can give Jesus is everything that I have. Isn't that interesting that this is the story of people in church. And maybe this is the story of some of us. That in one part we have a crowd who is following after a Jesus that can get me healthy, that can get me wealthy, that can give me all the things that I think I deserve. Or maybe you're in the crowd that says, you know what, I'm going to follow after Jesus and I'm going to sacrifice everything that I have and I'm going to give him everything that I have and I'll follow him. And if it costs me my life, I'll follow Christ. If it costs me relationships, I'll follow Christ. If it costs me moving across the country, I'll follow Christ Jesus. There's a a, a scholar by the name of J.C. Ryle. He's, again, if I quote someone, they're likely dead um, because all the smart people seem to be older Uh, Maybe there's a reason for that. Listen to what J.C. Ryle says in his exposition of this particular passage. The spirit of these narrow-minded fault finders is unhappily only too common. Their followers and successors are to be found in every part of Christ's visible church. There is never wanting a generation of people who decry what they call extremes in religion and are incessantly recommending what they term moderation in the service of Christ. If a man devotes his time, money, and affections to the pursuit of worldly things, they do not blame him. If he gives himself up for the service of money, pleasure, or politics, they find no fault. But if the man devotes himself and all that he has to Christ, they can scarcely find words to express their sense of folly. He is beside himself, they say. He is out of his mind, they say. He's an enthusiast. He's a fanatic. He's an extremist, they say. And yet if I dissect the culture of the world, here's what we have. It is okay to bow your knee to the people like the philanthropy people of Bill Gates, the 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 ecology people of the likes of Al Gore and we worship everything they do and we bow their knee and yet no one bats an eye and says the people that are following following them are extremists and they're stupid but 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 here's the here's here's where it goes crazy okay if and JC Ryle this was like a, like 100 or 150 years ago when he wrote this Man, man was a prophet and didn't even realize it. He, here's the ridiculousness of our culture. If I give up everything I have, and this is J.C. Ryle's point, if I give up everything that I own, if I follow Christ, if I, 
if I believe a certain way that, I don't know, maybe, maybe let's get a little political if that's okay. That may make some of you uneasy, but I don't really care. If I believe that there, the, the baby in the womb is, is a human and it is an autonomous baby, then you know what I'm marked as? An extremist. Oh, that's the extremist view. Oh, you're just like those extremists. If I believe in like, like the, a biblical perspective of life, of marriage, of, of how to treat people, then, then, then how am I labeled? Oh, I can't, I can't believe that you would do these types of things. You are an what? Extremist. But yet I bow my knee to the woke agenda of some type of green way or some type of philanthropy of, of Bill Gates or whatever kind of garbage that culture is trying to force feed down your throat. You bow your knee to that. You're not an extremist. Oh, you're smart. You're intelligent. Oh, welcome to our cult. Welcome to the new religion of culture. But when we follow Christ and we follow his word down to the T, and the disciples look at this woman who is sacrificing everything that she has, and they look at her and they scoff and they snort and they growl, and they must be thinking this woman is an extremist. Get her out. Then lastly, look at Jesus's how Jesus commends her. Well, the response of the people, they're scolding her. And then you look down at verse 8. Jesus says, she has done what she could. Hey, isn't that wonderful? That, what that ought to do is like lift up some type of heaviness from some of you and a weight from some of you, the weight of achievement, the weight of, uh, you know, trying to achieve your way, you know, trying to make your way right before the Lord. The Lord's response is such a wonderful phrase that should just give us all an opportunity to just kind of breathe in for just a moment and breathe out. Jesus looks what she says and he just says, it's what she's done, what she could. And then Jesus says, why don't you leave her alone? Why are you troubling her? She's done a beautiful thing. You will always have the poor with you. What is Jesus doing here with that particular phrase, you will always have the poor? He's just making it clear what the law had taught, and he's quoting the law, that there will always be poor poor among you. But the law provided provisions in caring for the poor, in caring for those in need. So he's not saying that, oh, these poor people, oh, oh, oh." he's not doing anything like that. What he's saying is, listen, there's provisions to take care of them. We, have, we, we ought to be a people of care and compassion who is taking care of the poor, taking care of those who are homeless, taking care of the widows. Jesus is not negating that. I think Jesus is like aligning himself with that idea. But what Jesus is trying to pull together are this, is this band of knuckleheads and trying to show them what she is doing is something outside of that. What she is doing is she is preparing me for my burial. She is preparing for what is about to take place. And boy, these disciples, they just, they don't get it quite a bit. I mean, how can you have Jesus as your rabbi? Have you ever thought about this? I just think about it. How can you have Jesus as your rabbi, yet you, are, you, you have just, you, you know, um, this is the pupil that the teacher looks at the back of the class and says, you need to come sit at the front of the class. Because you just don't get it. That, that's, 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 that's the disciples. In fact, this is why Jesus said in, in the upper room discourse that, you know what? <laughs> and this is Matthew's uh, paraphrase of this. And this is my way of interpreting this. this is, Jesus is like, you know what? You're... The Holy Spirit's going to come and he's going to give you all understanding and he's going to be your counselor and he's going to find... It, this is a way of Jesus saying like, whew, you need the Holy Spirit because y'all just dumb. Right? I mean, that, that's, that's just my interpretation. Maybe that's wrong. I don't know. But Jesus just looks at him. 
you guys never get it. You know, you're always arguing, you're bickering, you're growling at a woman, like that's weird. And, and so Jesus takes them up to the upper room and he's like, you know what? I've got good news. Though you are pretty dumb right now, the Holy Spirit is going to come upon you and give you wisdom beyond your understanding. And they just don't get it at this point. They still don't get it right now. And Jesus is trying to get them in their understanding that what, why are you worried? Oh, so now you're worried about the poor, right? Like, it just seems like, well, what, there has not been anything written about a disciple's concern about the poor. There, there's been plenty written about the disciple saying, get those kids out of here. Get, can we draw the crowds away? There's been plenty of that. But now suddenly they take on this mantle of, oh, look, we are like the justice warriors of our day. And so now Jesus is like, oh, really? Come on. I see through your garbage. This woman is doing something. In fact, he says, what this woman has done will be talked about forever. And guess what? You're in Utah in the year 2023. And what are we talking about? We're talking about some random woman who came up in there with all her jar of ointment and just showered it upon our Savior. Kings, presidents, dictators, CEOs, wealthy men have been buried and long forgotten about. Come on, can you name every single U.S. president? Maybe one of you can, I don't know. But my guess is that none of us can. Can you name every king that has ruled on the planet? Can, can you name every wealthy person that has made at least, you know, maybe 10 billion or more? We all know a story about a little old lady, little lady who came, comes in and she's got this jar. It's her life saving. It's, every, it's her future. And we know about this story about a woman who comes and prepares Christ for his burial. And you know, I, just, I also wonder, and again, this is Matthew. This is, I, I believe that yes, what this woman is doing is preparing Christ for his burial. But I don't think it's too far off for me to say that if the purpose of ointment was not just for a burial, but also for a marriage, then perhaps she wasn't just anointing him for his burial, but she was anointing him for a marriage that was going to take place. Remember, we just got out of an eschatological view of how the end will come. And then when the end comes, Christ will come and the groom will be ushered in with his bride. Maybe this woman didn't realize this. But perhaps what she's also doing is not just preparing his body for burial, but she is preparing the groom for his bride. And so just a couple of points here, and I, and I will be out of our way. Just a few observations, and I think these are obvious observations that I think we all have to wrestle with. And, the, and it's the question that pops out that's the easiest question. And the question is, who are you in the story? Are you the scalder? Are, are you the one who is grumbling? Are you the one who is complaining? Are you the one who's looking around and is like, you know what? Well, we ain't done it like this. You know, we didn't do it like this model chart. You know, we didn't do it this way. Or, or, or why are we doing things like this? Or why is this person worshiping like they're doing? You know, you're just grumbling about every person. You're, you're, you know, you just get angry about everything. Or are you the woman in the story? who is willing to sacrifice everything that she has. And I think, and if I could press, is are you the extremist? And I, I hope that the answer is yes. Do not let culture tell you that that is bad. Because when we see people, and here's how I know some of us aren't extremists, because when we see people who are in need, or when we see, when we feel like there's an opportunity, you know, I should pray with this person, or I should share the gospel with this person, and then we get a little scared, and we just kind of run off and just go about our day, then, then, then what, what are we then? We're definitely not extremists, then we're, we're, we're moderate in our faith. 
We're moderate in our faith. You know what I, I don't like? And I, I, I'm not going to get on a soapbox here, but I mean, I might as well. You, I can't, like, I don't like moderates. I don't, I don't like political moderates. I don't like anything moderate. Because what that says is that I really don't have a firm standing on anything. Like, like, think about that when it comes to, in terms of politics. Well, I'm a moderate. Oh, so what you mean is you don't care. You don't have the gahulas to make a stand. Maybe that was a little too much for some of you. Maybe you don't have what it takes to take a, a, a firm stand on something. Oh, okay. You're a coward. I got gotcha. you. You know, when we see people praying out in a park or we see some people sharing the gospel or we see someone, I don't know, and I, I, you know, I don't know how I feel about this, street preaching, or when you just, when you know there's a need and you go meet the need, you know, that's what sacrifice, that's what Christ is calling us into. This woman giving everything to Christ. And that's the call to all of us. Are you willing to follow after Christ, not after some moderate view that I'll just do it enough, I'll just give a little, I'll just do a little, I'll just share a little. But the call that I see in this story is that Christ is calling us to give our all. And if that labels us as a Christian extremist, then label me a Christian extremist. Because one day I'll stand before the throne of God and he will not look at me and say, my goodness, what a successful person you were. My cry, my prayer is, he looks at us and says, come in my faithful servant. And with that we wrestle and you struggle with it yourself.